So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and today's topic is one, I would, we were just talking about it then. Uh, today's topic is one which is really, really relevant right now, uh, pertinent to a lot of people. And also, um, it's, it, it, it's something that isn't necessarily done easily. And that is pivoting at pace. Pivoting at pace. Um, I have I have been explain a video because pivoting I could I could talk about until I'm blue in the face, but the um, the, the fact is the guy who coined the phrase pivot, a guy called Eric Reese. He has a he has a fantastic way of putting it. So I'm going to actually play his. It's a it's a three minute video which explains the pivot and just goes into it a bit more detail and explains it far far better than I could ever. Um, so as, as, as we go through this, we're here for an hour. Um, it will be recorded. If you have to step out, no problem at all. We'll be sending the recording out. Um, I've got a tool for you to use, and it's a, an equation. Everyone loves an equation. I've got an equation for us to use um, if you are planning on actually pivoting or, or doing something different. Um, but the main focus of today is actually speaking to some people who have been involved with pivoting their own business or have been involved in pivoting with other businesses as well. So we're gonna to talk to those guys, we're gonna ask them a few strategic questions. Um, I also have my colleague and confidant, uh, Faye Watkin on the line, who's gonna be um, working with the chat, making sure everything's um, going on there. Please do direct your questions onto the chat. And if you are asking a question, please direct it to a person. Uh, so put their name first and then ask the question. Um, we talked about being on mute. I've got a slide for this, but I thought, well, let's just go into it. Um, if, please make sure you are on mute uh, at all times, just to make sure we don't get the interference with, the, with those who are speaking. Um, and I think the other point is this, this power hour is about getting something. It doesn't have to be huge. It can be a little tiny bit of something, a bit of insight, a bit of help and support, which is gonna help you move forward in whatever you're doing. So by, by the end of it, hopefully you'll have, um, hopefully you'll have some uh, little nuggets of information that you can go and use. Uh, and also Faye will be putting into uh, the chat a, a link. Please, please, please go onto that link and just fill, it's a very quick survey. What it does, it allows us to understand the landscape right now, where people are um, in their entrepreneurial journeys, and that helps us tailor our support and the titles of these webinars and support moving forward. So if you can go on there and just, just please copy and paste that link into a browser um, and, 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 and just fill that in, that'd be great. It would really help us to help you. So I've just I've got that added on now, so um, well, yeah. Thanks, thanks Faye, super. So, as with anything, we always start with the mindset of the entrepreneur um, and, and look at areas of the map which, uh, which we need to focus in on at specific times. Uh, as ever, I'm going to tell you right now, you don't need to get all of these things done and focus in on all of these things at once. It's about knowing when to dial them up, when to dial them down, and which bits that are going to help you day to day move forward. Different iterations, be better than you were yesterday, create the right mindset for success, move forward and, uh, and, and keep rocking. So um, you're probably looking at that thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm great at some of those, I'm not so good at others, and that is absolutely natural and normal. Um, and I think when we come on to the panelists, we start talking to people uh, about what they've been up to. A few of these areas, which maybe they're not as strong at, they've got help, support, they've collaborated, they've brought people on board, which has actually helped them with this and helped them to move, pivot and move at pace. So don't think you have to do all of these at once, but just dial them up and down whenever you need to and just recognize when you're in the grip of something that isn't being helpful as well. That's the mindset of the entrepreneur. Uh, constantly curious is an area we're looking at today. Taking action, lean work ethic, being able to pivot, flex, move quickly. Um, and, and I guess just the bottom left one there, being uncomfortable, getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. Uh, real mindset consideration, especially if you're an entrepreneur. So just a quick recap of those housekeeping things today. Uh, audio and video should be off, keep, just keep the bandwidth strong. Use the chat box to ask the questions. We will aim to cover as many questions as possible in the time, and hopefully we'll be able to bring people in to ask questions and share experiences of pivoting as well. 
because the more help and support we can get from those people who are on this call, the better we'll all leave this call and, 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 and more tools and support we'll, we'll, we'll get to move forward. So yeah. Um, and I've told you this, uh, this session is being recorded and the will, link will be circulated. So if you don't want to be featured, uh, you, don't need to put your, um, you don't need to put your video on and we don't need to, uh, you don't need this out. So, okay. So without further ado, what we will do is watch, one second, a quick introduction to actually, what do we mean by pivoting? I said earlier that Eric Reese was the guy who coined this phrase. Uh, part of the Lean Startup movement, um, along with Steve Blank um, over in Harvard. Um, and he, he just explains a pivot much better than me. So I'm going to play the video and hopefully you'll be able to listen in and just get a better understanding of what we're actually talking about when we talk about a pivot. Here we go. that our experiments have stopped being productive, let us pivot to a new fundamental strategy that could allow us to do better experiments. That's what a pivot is. I was groping around for a way to describe a phenomenon that I kept seeing in the startups I was working with. So I wrote a blog post. I mean, the blog post, it wasn't like coining the term pivot. It just said, pivot, don't jump to a new vision. Now I'm good at encapsulating it crisply. A pivot is a change in strategy without a change in vision. I show in my slides now a, a cartoon I saw, I kid you not, in the New Yorker magazine. There's a man and a woman sitting in an outdoor cafe and the caption below says, I'm not leaving you, I'm pivoting to another man. So the word pivot is probably my most notorious contribution to the, the startup vernacular. Here's the critical thing you gotta understand about the pivot. It's really very simple. You get in your car, you don't boot up your GPS and say, GPS, where do I wanna go? It doesn't know, it's just a robot. It helps you get where you wanna go. So the vision is the destination you have have in mind. But if you run into an obstacle, you don't just drive your car into the obstacle over and over again in the hopes that it will be fine. You, with the help of your GPS, find a way around. Okay, very simple. Startups that succeed all do that really well. They start out with an idea that sounds good but turns out to be terrible. YouTube started out as a dating site and they only after people were starting to upload all kinds of video did they make the pivot to a video site. Flickr was an online video game. One of the things you could do in the online game was upload photos. And since that's the only thing players actually did, they said, hey, maybe we make it, we call it a zoom in pivot, where you take one part of the product and you make the whole product, you shrink it down to just that one thing. You make the world's best photo uploading service, even though you meant to make an online game. First version of Twitter was this thing called Odeo, which is a podcasting service. When they made the pivot to Twitter, it only had a few hundred customers, so the so-called vanity metrics were so low, they actually went to their investors and said, we're so embarrassed about these results, would you like your money back? And several of Silicon Valley's best investors made what is now a billion dollar mistake of saying yes, thank you. So you look at PayPal, which is about like digital cyber cash on your PDA. You're like, boy, what kind of visionary is that? But they had the vision for online payments in some form, they just didn't know exactly what it was gonna look like. Let's talk about Groupon, because it's one of my favorites. Groupon started out as a business called The Point, which was designed to help people do petitions. So imagine Imagine that you're like, okay, I want to do a protest at City Hall. I'm mad about something. I don't want to be the only person who shows up. So we have a petition where if 100 people sign up and say, we'll all go to the protest, it tips and we all do it. If we never get to 100, it doesn't tip. Great idea, right? Wrong. They got no traction at all. It was a disaster. It didn't work. So they're like, okay, we got to try something new. They decided to try the social commerce thing. Social commerce is about creating coupons where we all get a discount if we all buy at the same time. I think it was two for one pizza in the pizza restaurant in the lobby of their building. Okay, that was the breakthrough technology. 20 people redeemed it. Now, I don't know about you. If I had been there, I would have known. Oh, obviously, 20 free pizzas equals fastest company in history to get a billion dollars in sales. But most of us, let's be honest, we would not have known. 20 free pizzas, whatever. The reason the Groupon founders understood the power of selling 20 free pizzas is that they had failed for a year to get anybody to buy anything at all. That actually made them excited enough to try the next experiment and the next and the next and the next. That's what a pivot is. It is redeeming the failure because we learned so much about what's possible. That's the name of the game. That's what this is about. As I said, he does it so much better than me. So uh, really, a really great understanding of actually what Pivot is. I can zoom in um, and look at aspects of your business model that you have right now and just kind of amplify them a little bit. It's certainly I love his analogy about going, you know, the vision doesn't, the vision remains the same. You don't keep driving your car 
uh, into a brick wall. And that brick wall right now is COVID-19 and, and everything that's coming around uh, and around about that. So, you know, looking for an opposite, uh, looking for a different direction around this obstacle, exactly what we're talking about when it comes to activity, keeping businesses afloat uh, and just tweaking and playing with something that's going to help you move forward. So, Without further ado, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to introduce the, uh, the panel of people, of, of entrepreneurs. Now, Richard, I'll come to you in a second, because I'm, I don't know if you consider yourself an entrepreneur, but I think I do. But anyway, <laughs> we'll come on to you shortly. Um, so first off, I'll just get the guys to introduce themselves, um, and just very quick synopsis of your business, what it did and what it was before this crisis hit. So, Ben, over to you. Yeah, so uh, my name is Ben Barker. I'm in a company called Artemis Pre Limited, um, and we have a brand called Artemis. And for the past five years, we focus uh, on everything uh, cold brew coffee. So when the well, basically before the trend first hit the UK, um, we were one of the, the first companies to start and pioneer the trend of cold brewing coffee, which is steeping it in cold water for anywhere between 12 and 24 hours. You get a really low bitterness beverage, and um, it can be packed in bottles, kegs, etc. So we serve a variety of industries from independent coffee shops all the way through to cocktail bars, restaurants, hotels, and the end consumer. Have a 60 second break. That was great. Well done, Ben. Thank you. Um, Mark. Where's Mark? Yeah. Am I still here? You are. Just come a bit closer so we can see you and hear you, Mark. Okay. Um, how's that? Perfect. Good. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm Mark. Uh, my business is Quizbit, uh, an interactive uh, uh, quiz platform. Um, it's currently a pub quiz being played in around about 800 pubs up and down the country. Um, as I alluded to before, on the 20th of March, every pub that takes my quiz decided that it would shut its doors, or the government decided to shut their doors, um, for obviously good reason. Um, we are now in the middle of our biggest pivot ever. Um, we've always planned to go from Quizbit, the interactive pub quiz, to Quizbit, the interactive quiz. Um, but our hand has kind of been forced. So um, uh, Quizbit Live is now a thing um, with um, around about 10,000 people playing every week, which has happened okay. in the last two weeks. Thank you, Mark. Uh, and finally on the panel, we have uh, Richard Seal um, from Delaware Consulting. Richard, introduce yourself and um, what was your business well, what does your business do, I guess? Okay, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, Richard Seal, I'm the Managing Director of Delaware Consulting across the US and the UK. Um, we are a IT consultancy providing SAP and Microsoft services um, to all sorts of organizations. And uh, well, the challenge um, for everybody is sort of, as a discussion here is, is pivoting. We're we're picking up uh, work with organizations which are pivoting themselves and we're helping them. And this is how I got into this discussion, helping them reorganize themselves and address new challenges, especially within the supply chain. So I'm a, I'm a supply chain um, consultant effectively, and I've been providing two small businesses uh, in the UK in Leeds, and we can discuss that in a bit, um, on how they can manage and support their challenges uh, to supply either in this case their customer base with new products and yeah. address some of the challenges of the volumes that they're experiencing yeah. and is this a new collaboration uh, relationship with you or was it an existing one richard um this was a new collaboration i mean ironically it's the guy that uh, is one of the senior guys in the uk business lives next to the guy that runs uh, a small manufacturing business uh, within just outside leeds in yeah, outside Harrogate in Boston Spa, and he had a uh, um, had a a big challenge. He uh, he's a company company called Quick Change, which made um, small cash trays, and had a pretty mature business. And suddenly this crisis came along, and he uh, the banks and the building societies in the UK decided they weren't going to be buying those things at this point in time. So he. Uh, quickly changed his business and, uh, and having a customer, ba a customer base being the, uh, the banks and the building societies saw the opportunity to, pro to provide sneeze screens. Um, so he turned his manufacturing process uh, or his manufacturing business into making these sneeze screens. But his challenge was being able to ship the volumes um, and have a process to be able to manage this. I mean, 
he was in when we talk, spoke to him first he was in absolute chaos he had spreadsheets all over the place so we just put a process in place spun up an IT system within 48 hours for him over the weekend and got him operating and provide back office support to uh, help him run the business where you can manufacture these things put them in boxes and ship them but we provide a sort of a, a back office solution to uh, keep him in uh, in control and uh, He's been very appreciative of the support we've been able to provide. And that, that, I've seen them going in um, at these screens in a load of places, especially supermarkets, um, local market dispensers, local Aldi. They've got them up now, um, and they they're going up in in thousands of places across the UK, which means something's had to change rapidly. And and part of that is definitely the supply chain logistics and being able to move at pace to actually supply those. So and that's one of the reasons we got Richard on is because he's he's seeing the other side of it. Somebody has a need and a problem, and you have the solution to be able to help them with that. So I mean, it's um, yeah. Thank you for for being on. Just to come back to you, Ben. Um, Mark talked about the online quiz, uh, and now sorry the the pub quiz. Uh, and the pain point there being that the fact that you know a whole lot of pubs have been shut down, so he's got to pivot at, at pace and, and move to doing his online model. Just tell us how you pivoted from doing the cold brew coffee. What what area did you then focus on? Yeah, so um, for for us, just to give you a, an idea on what happened in in our business, um, obviously with the um, expected lockdown uh, coming up. Uh, all the, the bars and distributors and anywhere that bought um, products that were in the hospitality industry and um, cancelled their orders or put them on hold for um, the expected lockdown to actually happen. And then when it actually it, it got, you know, two days before we even had orders from distributors being revoked that had been placed a month and a half uh, earlier that were, that were due for um, completion. Um, so from our perspective, very much like Mark, the whole business, all our revenue went from steady monthly income even in a quiet time to absolutely zero um, and and to the point where we were you know voiding invoices that had been billed a month before and um, so we were in a position where you know the guidance hadn't come out yet for furloughing and everything like that and even so we'd still need support um, and uh, I was also hearing from many friends that work in the industry um, and people that I meet that there was a, a massive lack of PPE available um, and one of the things that we've been running for the past two and a half years in the business is um, a production of alcoholic products. So we make um, espresso martinis on draft and keg form and various different products for the alcohol industry. So we already had about half the licenses to be able to produce um, denatured alcohol and hand sanitizer. Um, and so within about the space of about half a, say half a week to a week, we had all the applications in for the remainder of the licenses with HMRC um, and we managed to get um processed extremely quickly um given the fact that you know we were effectively like most people in this scenario a business at risk um and we pivoted using our production equipment um to producing hand sanitizers um in 60 mil 250 mil 500 mil a liter uh, and larger volumes for bigger companies as well and um, so obviously the back end having a brewery allowed us to have the production equipment to be able to mix bottle and, and pack products like this um, and then the licenses that we we obtained or already had from HMRC allow us to bring, uh, bring in bulk raw ethanol um, and process it um, in the correct way to to form World Health and Organization approved hand sanitizer. What was the what was the moment or what was the when did the light bulb suddenly ping that said actually here's something we could do? Just tell me how you got to that that light bulb moment of hang on a minute we've already got the licenses here to go and do this um so i guess it's a, a combination of different factors you know i think when you um when many consumers view uh, certain products they look at it as uh, a difficult thing to make or achieve and and from a business mind i always think when you start breaking stuff down you often find the simplicity that lies at the heart of it um, and so with hand sanitizer realistically there are just you know a few core ingredients um, for this one specifically, you know, you've just got a base alcohol, you've got um, uh, an emollient, um, and you've got a, an, anti, uh, an antifungal. 
Um, and they're just ingredients, you know, realistically, as, as long as you have the correct approvals and have got a, a facility that can deal in, in clean room packing and so on, um, it, it's just another product. And so for us, it was, you know, realistically, if we're a manufacturing business, we can manufacture many different things. And if we have the licenses, we can do it. And I think the, it, it wasn't so much like, a, oh, this is an opportunity. It was like, well, we sat here doing absolutely nothing at the moment, you know, strategizing and planning for the future is pointless because we don't know what the future is is going to be whether businesses and you know we had customers that we, we said can we hold invoices for saying we might not be here in a few months so there's no point holding the invoices and um, so it was a case of like right, we want to be able to help and do something this is the product that's in demand and we can make it given um the certain approvals so we didn't know if we were going to get the approvals and that was the biggest thing there's so many companies that want to be able to do this and individuals that are trying to do it at home um, but you've you've got to do it in the right way, and for us, we we just weren't certain that we get them, and all we all we could do is apply. So I just racked my brains, worked out what we could do and what we couldn't, and, yeah. and cracked on with it. Who's in, um, coming over to you, Mark? Actually, uh, interestingly, you know, you talk about your quiz model that was in pubs, uh, in house, people playing them every week, um, and there's also an element of kind of um, uh, corporate learning and training that you also do within that. We'll, we'll leave that to one side for a second. How did you know that there was a market? How did you know that every single one of us, probably on this call, will be doing online quizzes like once a week at least, uh, every, every week since the um, past few weeks? How did you know there was a demand for it? I didn't, to be truthful. Um, <laughs> well, part, well, part, the answer we're looking for, Mark. No, well, there's a method, there's a, there's a reason for my answer is that. Yeah. You talk a lot, because this is one thing I learned, because I was part of Entrepreneurial Spark for a long time, and obviously I've known Jeremy for quite a few years now, and, and, and obviously what you guys do, and when you talk about mindset and various other things, and one of the things that I've realized, this might not answer your question, but I hope it does, is um, I need to get out of my own way, basically. So did I realize that people were going to, did I realize it would be so popular? The idea is no, but the reason being is that, I mean, this is my third startup. I've, I've sold products successfully to pubs for many years. So I'm in my comfort zone selling products to pubs. When someone comes to me and says, right, actually what you need to do now is you need to go virtual, you need an app, and you need to make this go viral, and you could be looking at having 10,000 people play every week, all of a sudden I kind of go, ah, well, sounds good, but I'm all right with my pubs, I'm okay for now, we're turning over all that money, I employ enough people, and we'll leave it at that for now. So I kind of, I didn't know, I knew that I had an idea and there was a chance of it, um, but my hand's been completely and utterly forced because of that, We've now, as I say, you know, over 10,000 people playing every week. You know, we have people playing live in Zoom meetings like this now and, and all hours of the day. Um, the first one that, that we did virtually was a, a, a guy who came and said, look, I've got about 500 people. No, I've got about 100 people, sorry, that want to join my online course. So we said, okay, we set him up an account. We gave him it just for the standard price that we were giving it to the pubs. And we, we, we said, look, have a go with YouTube Live and see how that works. And this was literally on the 20th. 1st of March, I think, something like that. Um, and he had 800 people playing, the whole thing broke. Um, so we had to then, obviously, decide what we we're gonna do. So we've got developers now, so our developer basically got to work very quickly to change things. But the upshot of it all is um, what we're building now is um, we, we have now teamed up and partnered with Intel and with AWS. This has all happened over two weeks. This is just crazy. And we've got a project manager on board now. We're working with BGSS. And we're actually going to be putting live streaming. We're building two apps. Uh, and we're going to be putting live streaming into those apps. So you can live stream your own quiz show and be your own quiz host to anybody um, all over. Yeah, we I mean, it, it's interesting you talk about the mindset and just stepping out of your comfort zone. Um, and, and we'll come on to the, what, what, what actually forced your hand. It probably, probably a, a number of different things. I just wanted to pick up on that last point. You know, you're now collaborating with so and so, this, this, that, and the other. Um, and we're seeing more and more of those collaborations, relationship building, network enhancing, uh, to 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 help people. And and there seems to be an appetite for people to help other people as well. That kind of brings me on to Richard. You know, you talk about that, that it's just a neighbor of a neighbor. Tell me how that connection was made and and. And, you know, why, why wasn't that connection made before? <laughs> you know, I think the I think to the point I think Mark made um, was it Ben about being comfortable. Things were just 
were just fine. I think this guy just uh, works through man managing director of Quick Change. He was uh, he was comfortable with his business. He'd got a good customer base, and uh, there was no need to to really change up. And this current crisis has forced his hand. Having a customer base out there, which I think is the key thing, is he's got a he's got a channel to market already. He knows he has the relationships. He's trusted by those customers. He was able to offer an alternative to them very quickly. He didn't have to. Uh, he didn't have to build confidence with those customers. Um, they've got that confidence. And when we were able to help him turn around those things um, very quickly um, by providing the process and the IT solution to be able to deliver those things quickly, he's actually uh, he's actually grown his uh, as part. His product footprint is going from sneeze screens to uh, hand sanitizers. He's becoming the supply point um, for Santander Bank. Um, yeah. So, I mean, he's been, he's been able to grow that business now by being able to demonstrate he can deliver. And that's, that's really what we've been able to do is support him. Yeah, and it's amazing to hear that because, you know, I guess for those of you who've been on, on a few of these before, I keep banging on. Banging on about understanding your customer journey and really, really understanding how their needs have changed and how their buying habits have changed, their customer and user journeys have changed. And then, you know, you, you say the um, your, your, your client at, at Quick Change has realized that something's changed in his customer and he's been able to meet that demand by slightly changing something over here, which, which is music to my ears because he obviously knows his customer and knows that, knows that journey. Which is really interesting. Yeah, I think he knows that he knows his customer, and to your, he's entrepreneurial. He's looking for an opportunity. He's keeping his business alive, um, maybe for the, the next two or three months, which will then return hopefully back to what it was before. But he may have a expanded um, product portfolio and generated himself a lot more opportunities to drive revenue and and grow his business. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Um, what I just just open this up to anybody who wants to answer this on the panel, but um, what would you say the key attributes to making a pivot at pace stick? Feedback. Say again, Mark. Uh, so feedback. Um, you, one of the things that um, we do now more than ever, and we never did it really did before, is it's getting things out there and just trying them. I think people in the current world that we're living in and the way that things are going is people are a lot more acceptable of things that don't work so well. That doesn't mean to say that they don't have to work great and doesn't mean to say that you do things that don't work, but people realize that this is a very unprecedented situation. So therefore, you know, the idea to build things quick and break things and find out what's broken and find out what works and come back to things and, and get your feedback and do that loop. It's, it's kind of like being a little bit of a hamster wheel at the minute for us. Yeah, so yeah. we're able to test things we're able to do things so we can jump on skype calls with big companies or zoom calls or whatever it may be and play the quiz with everybody and um, yeah. we can then look at what we want to do with streaming in the app and we can decide instead of spending six months trying to figure out whether it would work we've got a short small window really to try and get this out to as many people as we can yeah. so therefore why 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 try and look to expand it over six months and just let's get it done in six weeks it's interesting how you talked about earlier, Mark, how you know you, you you're expecting hundred people on the platform to do the quiz and then suddenly eight hundred was eight five five or eight hundred turn up and it crashed. That one yeah. Again. yeah, so I had to think pretty quick about that. Um, yeah, well that's the thing, you know, but but what you what you didn't do was just say, ah no, that doesn't work and we're gonna go and we're gonna go over here. You redeemed the failure of that crashing, mm -hmm. understood what happened, and mm -hmm. then that forced your hand to actually change something and change it at pace. And that iterative process, something hasn't worked right, I'm going to learn from that. I'm not just going to take that knock and just go and hide in the corner. I'm actually going to do something about it and move forward. The yeah. attribute, the yeah. attribute of, uh, of, of making this stick, for sure. The, the, problem with the um, thing that I was going to say, which basically ties into to your end point, um, Jeremy, is resilience. Um, I yeah. think you've just got to have it. You don't, not necessarily don't take no for an answer, but you don't take failure as an option. You uh, you just keep working until you find a way around it. So you know, for yeah. us, like we were getting it was left, right, and centre. But if you often, if you put the human aspect to it, um, you know, you get somewhere, and it, yeah, it's it's often a case of like, well, if you can't do it this way, there's definitely going to be another way to do it. And I think um, when you pivot in, you know, you pivot in for a good reason. You're going from failure 
yes so if you stop at the first hurdle you know you, you're never going to get there you've got to keep on going yeah but just just to add to that i think yeah. uh, i think people make decisions faster that's what i'm seeing i'm seeing whether they're good decisions or bad decisions i'm seeing people make decisions faster and therefore things are happening faster people aren't sitting there and saying well we'll ponder on this for a few weeks they don't have time to ponder on it they need to make that decision now get on with it and and that's what i'm seeing um, across the board in all sorts of places yeah i mean yeah. Talking about as well people are you know there's a lot of people sat around furloughed and people look but these people doesn't mean to think that they're not thinking about what they're going to do when they come out of the other side of this so whoever's you know speaking to these people now and coming up with the ideas the people have the space now to, to think actually well we could do this and maybe that is a good idea or maybe we could look at doing that now and if you contact these people now if you look at how you can actually offer your services now and um, you know so we're speaking to some big brands about doing you know quizzes with 10,000 people in them you know before it might be well I can't speak because we're actually too busy with this or we're too busy with that that's not an excuse at the minute people you know have got to not that I have to listen to you by any means, but they're certainly more open to saying, actually, let's have a look at this thing that Mark was going to put to us that you know a few months ago. And yeah, I, I think that's I think that's a really good point. People are accepting to maybe listen and do something, whether they say no or yes, but they are more accepting to listen to uh, to new ideas. And I think this is a, I mean, as tragic as a crisis it is, I think there's a, some going to be some great opportunities to come out of this in all different places. Yeah, I totally agree with you. You know, you look back to the recession, 2008, some amazing businesses came out of that um, simply because they were able to move the pace. Um, and yeah, those decision-making uh, processes, the red tape has been somewhat diminished uh, around that decision-making. So now is an, is, is an amazing opportunity to go and try something. Um, and if it fails, redeem the failure and go again. Build that resilience like Ben talks about and, uh, and keep, keep going. Um, and there, there was a couple of businesses who we invited onto this who um, I just wanted to make mention of because uh, the the guys at um, now Chris Hillage is a director at STEM. Um, he's making uh, decathlon mask converters, and you've probably seen them. They're the kind of um, diving masks oh no no snorkeling masks which are now being converted to fit the oxygen supply in hospitals that really really chimed with us because what they've actually done is actually the um i can't remember the fab lab people over in and i want to say france have actually uh, put their design of this little converter and open sourced it so anybody can take that with a 3d printer and print it more and more open source stuff is out there. So if you are unfamiliar with open source, um, open source technology, open source uh, methodologies, go and look them up because there might be something that you can use within that open source equipment or toolbox to do something either with a product, a service, a, a, a technology, to tweak it slightly to move in a different direction. That's exactly what Chris has done. He's now supplying into um, a, num a number of hospitals. The other person that I wanted to make mention of is, um, is a lady called Mel Bound. Some of you might be aware of her. She, um, she runs a, a network uh, of mums who run, and it's called This Mum Runs. Uh, now, what they've been able to do is pivot slightly. So instead of just going on a normal route A to B, the, the, the women who are part of, or the mums who are part of this network are now running to a pharmacist or the pharmacy, picking up the, uh, the drugs or the, or the pharmaceuticals, whatever needs to be delivered, and delivering them to those in need and those who actually can't get out. And that's been part of her, her now business model and, and, and a big USP of getting people on board to her platform and her, her, um, her movement, if you will. It's called Drug Runners, which I thought was absolutely awesome. <laughs> um, but it's, it's just a tiny little change in what she's doing which has helped her stay relevant. She's, she wasn't able to join us today because she's filming with the BBC. And it's such a slight change, but it's a relevant change. She understands what people need and want and just slightly pivoted there. So there are a couple of people I just wanted to make mention of there. Um, there is a question on the chat. Uh, Deepak, do you want to actually come in and ask this question yourself? She's there. 
Hasn't dropped off, has he? Uh, no, I'm, I'm here. Sorry, I just yes. got my... I just asked that question. Um, so, my uh, simple question is, if these avenues you're pivoting it into, um, you know, these avenues, creating screens or whatever, they will disappear in one or two days. So, basically, you're pivoting because your existing market's kind of drying off or is kind of latent. So, once you move into this new avenues, yes, they will last for another couple of months, maybe. And then, then what happens? Because there's no guarantee your existing market's going to be back. Mm -hmm. And maybe another point, one of the things we was talking about was with eSpark is if, if that's not your core USP, you're likely to be, you know, the other people who are making more sanitizers or whatever, they will, they can grow their products and demand and have networks anyway. So they can get in back into that additional demand and undercut you. So how do you deal with three months hence, basically? Um, yeah. I'm, I'm just going to field, field something from a kind of a, an, an overarching view. And in terms of product delivery, yes, there are certain things which fit the market demand right now. But I think the point of the people who are on this call right now in terms of the, 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 the panel, they've understood where the market is going. They've understood what what they need to do to change the business model to stay afloat, stay relevant, keep trading and grow business and build the attributes which are going to keep them resilient and future proof within uh, the next big crisis, whatever that might look like. And it probably looks like a recession. Building those areas, it isn't just about the products that they have now. It's about those things that they've built up here and in the systems and procedures that they put in place to, to do what they've done now, to future-proof themselves. So they'll be able to do it again. Yeah. And I think that's what we need to be all looking at. Uh, guys, come in, just, you know, are you agreeing? Are you yeah, thinking? I, mean, I think Deepak, I mean, it, the thing is that, in my opinion, the world has changed forever, to be honest with you. Um, I don't think that this, this is a crisis, don't get me wrong, but this has changed the entire world and it will continue to change how people do business, how people live their lives, how people see the outside world, and how people interact with each other. And whichever way you look at that, that is changing on a daily basis. The world will get back to some level of normality, but it will never, ever be the same. The other thing is that we, is we, what we do, um, uh, and this is for any entrepreneur or anybody that looks to try and deliver at a time like this, is that what we're doing is not a sticking plaster. What we're doing adds value to our business. Um, we'll always add value to our business. And whether you're doing this in a crisis or whether you're doing this at the start of the journey or whether you're doing this when you want to try and sell your business, you're always trying to add value. So what you make sure that when you're doing it, by getting the right feedback from the people, as long as you're adding value to your business, as long as that business has a value, it doesn't matter if the world changes again in six months' time, you'll know what that value is and then you'll know how to move that forward and create more value in your next product. Um, yeah. So as Jeremy says, it's not just about actually coming to the end point of making something for this period. It's the journey that you go on to do that, the, dip, the bits that you learn from it, and then what you then take then moving forward into the next crisis. Because this will not end. This is still going to be, unfortunately, I think, you know, everyone is going to be doing things differently for, for many, many, many years to come. Yeah. Yeah, thank yeah, I mean, you. I mean, from, from uh, my point of view, I mean, I think we've brought understanding to a quick change on how to operate a supply chain with increased volume. I mean, that's hopefully what uh, the managing director there has taken and he's, he's been able to organize his processes and we've given him breathing space to be able to manufacture. So I think he will, he has understood how to be able to rapidly increase his production volume while able to uh, meet the customer demand at the same time. So I think, understanding and designing solid processes to be able to do that is definitely something I think you'll take away from this. Yeah, definitely. I think that's the, I think that's the major point, isn't it? It's developing those processes, systems, and, and just zooming out from the granular detail of we make a widget to we make a widget which delivers value, as Mark talks about, and that value isn't going to go away. And we can we understand that value. We can understand the value to the customer at the next crisis, in the next iteration, in the next world, in the next whatever. So, uh, yeah, really interesting. Um, I just wanted to come on to, on to this equation. We, we, we love an equation at Entrepreneurial Spark, uh, and I, it, it looks a bit daunting, but it's really, really dead simple. And it's the attributes and the little parts which might actually help you think about where you need to focus in to make a pivot or a change within your business. D 
equals dissatisfaction, V equals vision, first steps is F, and it has to be greater. Those three component parts have to be greater than the resistance to change. In a lot of areas right now, resistance, resistance to change is slightly diminished because of the demand and the need for certain types of things, and products, etc. But if you have these things, if you, if, you, if you make sure that there is a dissatisfaction with the status quo, you're solving a problem that more than one person has, and it's not just up here in your, in your head. If you really understand that problem, the value that you're creating, then, then you can, then, then you will decrease that uh, resistance to change and you will get people buying. Along with that, you have to create the right vision uh, of where you're going, bring people on board, create the network, collaborators, and, and have those people on board with where you're going on this journey to enable you to, again, decrease and diminish that resistance to change and increase the buying or the, or, or, or the process power on that side. So dissatisfaction, what is it? How can we understand it more? Customer journeys, all of those things, uh, and the value that we're creating. The vision, taking people along with you and really understanding where you're going with it and getting buy-in, because you need buy-in for people to actually take you up on this offer or this product or whatever it is. And then the first steps. Once you have the right, once you understand the dissatisfaction, you have created that vision, you need the first right step, the right first step. And we talk about in steps because it's not the mountain that we're going up. We're not going to that pinnacle straight away. We're going to take those small steps to increase that, increase that vision, decrease the um, dissatisfaction, and, in, and decrease the resistance to change. We use this in, uh, for entrepreneurs, for intrapreneurs, larger organizations, and people being able to change something rapidly, but understanding the fundamentals of change, understanding how we can actually change at pace, and doing those three things and focusing on those three things will help you decrease the resistance to change and move forward. So I wanted to share you with a, a quick tool that you can use, might give you a bit of focus when you're trying to do this or trying to change um, at pace. I wanted to just open up because we've got, we've got about 12 minutes left on this, but I wanted to hear from other people. I wanted to bring pe other people in and hear their experiences, what's going on in their world right now, um, quick snippets of where are you, how are you feeling, um, or any questions to the panel. So um, yeah, if you do want to bring yourself off mute, uh, join the discussion, uh, bring yourself on, onto the video, then please do. Uh, let's open this up a little bit and just hear some thoughts from other people. Who wants to, uh, who wants to start? Anything at all, anything goes. That's risky, isn't it? Do you know what? I might bring in Zoe because we know Zoe. Uh, and Zoe's trying to do something which a lot of people wouldn't ordinarily do uh, during a crisis. Is that fair to say, Zoe? Uh, yeah, completely fair to say. Um, I'm, set, <laughs> I'm looking for investment, basically. Yeah. Um, I'm just, um, actually, you guys, what you're mm -hmm. saying, um, you know, all of you, Richard, Ben, Mark, you're all saying everything that's ticking my boxes because um, I organize classic car rallies and I race classic cars and of course my industry's just come to a dead halt. Um, everything this year is actually going to be cancelled so um, so it's had a massive impact on me. So I've looked at my business in a completely different light. Um, it was something that I'd already thought of before but actually due to the current situation it gave me that big tick in the box. Um, and I do think it's, I think it's, I think one of the things it's also made me realize, and you guys it completely, you know, there's all so many different elements to your business. Yeah. You know, if you can do one thing, you can, you can implement that in any other kind of business. Um, so yeah, I'm looking, I, I, I am looking for investment. I am very positive about it. Um, Everybody else is a bit doom and gloom. I seem to be the giddy one about it all. <laughs> so, so, Zoe, so, Zoe, who are your customers? What is your custom base that you, you so, sell to at the moment? So at the moment, I just organize um, classic car rallies. So um, it, it's usually the elitist. So it's those ones that do have classic cars and that can afford to, I, mean, I, I, I did Georgia's very first, Georgia, I was in ex-Soviet Union, Georgia, underneath Russia. Um, I did their first ever rally in 2019. It was so successful. Word of mouth came out that I did another one last year. Obviously, I wanted to do one this year, but it got cancelled. 
But I was thinking, you know, from my perspective, because everything's, you know, I, I don't have a wealth, I, I don't come from an influential background or anything. I had to set up that rally company because I couldn't afford to, to go on other company on, on other rallies. And I want to bring that to a lot, a much bigger target audience. You don't have to have a classic car. I used to drive around and afford 1.1 Fiesta doing these rallies, you know, I, I, and it's a beautiful way to visit, to, to see your countryside. And, you know, you get so many fabulous memories from, you know, you're driving down a beautiful road in Mull in Scotland and you stop and buy mussels at the side of the road because there's an honesty box and it's, you know, you buy a kilo, you buy five kilos. I mean, you know, what's your honesty there? And then actually we came back the next day and it had a message, by the way, we suggest, you know, two pounds, one kilo and three pounds of five kilos, you know. And it's those little memories that, you know, you want to capture. And I want to be able to bring that to everybody you know, and, and, and bring a different way of traveling, so. I think, the, uh, I think one of the major things that it, certainly, Zoe, you, you're looking at is just understanding the value that you're creating um, for other people. And you just talked about it so eloquently just then, about the value that you create. And that's what these guys have talked about as well, is, is really, really, really understanding that value. Um, yeah. And, I, I, you know, I don't think you'll, I, I, I'm going to put my neck on the line. Here we go, Zoe. Here you go, for you, just for you. Um, <laughs> you know there shouldn't be a change in landscape in, uh, in in the in the investment world so if you create the right value you'll always have somebody to be able to invest in you and and fundamentally you hear it all the time on the old dragon's den and all those other things that 80 90 percent of the time they invest in the person themselves and if you're if, you, if you're um, if you're passionate you know your product your service you know what you're doing you know where you're going vision you know your first steps you know what the dissatisfaction is with the status quo right now <laughs> yeah and that resistance to investment will be diminished. So, uh, yeah, best of luck with it. Thank and, you. Uh, yeah, thank you for coming on there. Anybody else want to add any thoughts here? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was going to say something, because um, I'd love to go on your classic car, I love classic cars. <laughs> <laughs> we also know the dragons very well, and they're not very nice. Um, but, no. <laughs> but I think, obviously, talking, you know, this, people talk about this time, you know, the fact that I've got some space, they've got headspace, they've got time to do things as well. And, and you can build a really good tribe of people you can build a really good lot of fans you know as soon as you say classic cars then you do classic car rally the first thing i want to do is google it and have a look and see what you were talking about so you know just getting in front of a computer and talking to as many people about classic cars and and it might sound rather juvenile but you know looking at groups and looking at other people and making sure you're in the middle of them and making sure and i'm sure you do all these things you know already but you know by building up a fan base you know while yeah. people are sat at home and, and in, just the to do it. yeah so mark actually yeah, that's another tick in the box for me, actually, because um, I have been reaching out to a lot of people. I've been um, interacting a lot more with people on social media, on Instagram, things like that. Um, you know, I had a, a thousand followers and I've got over, over 2000 now. Um, and that's in the space of just uh, just over 10 days. Um, and that's interacting with people. And then people are actually coming back and saying, oh, I've just seen your website. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, my website's really out of date. But they love it. And they're like, it's so refreshing to, to see somebody who's so passionate about um, not, not, cars and bringing experiences to people. So lots, lots of investors drive sports cars as well, so you're probably all right, to be fair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Uh, does anybody else want to come in and just um, add any thoughts, any questions, anything at all? Come on, don't be shy. Step outside of your comfort zone and ask that question you want to ask. Yes, I'm not scared of the silence. Okay, I'll ask another question. I've got a, I've got a question. That? I've got a question. To, Who's that? I mean, it's Richard. <laughs> Richard, go on. So I just got a question. Are people, where are, I mean, I mean, I'm sitting in the US at the moment. Are people looking at expanding their markets, looking at alternate places to sell um, as well to try and build a larger customer base? I mean, I know I. I travel a lot between or did travel a lot between the uk the us and a number of other places globally it's like looking seeing the market just bigger than the uk and i think that's really important for um especially with the uk and brexit i think they've got to look outside the borders um as the new opportunities and new markets yeah uh I think, I, think it's, I think that's more of a comment than a question. Yeah, it's a comment. It's more, yeah, yeah comment. definitely, because, it, you know, 
you can talk about globalization and um, you know increased trade routes and and technologies like this, which allow Richard to sit where he is and speak to everybody in the UK from here. And you think, well, why aren't we doing business? Why aren't we looking wider? Why are we focusing just on the UK? Um, and I think I think it's a good comment just to kind of prod people to say, you know, the market isn't just here. There I mean, is this, this, the Go quiz, on. the quiz solution doesn't have to be UK. It could yeah. be. It could be in the US, it could be anywhere else, I mean. So last week we had a game with two people in Atlanta, so one person in New York, one person in um, uh, France, uh, not quite, Germany, uh, and me in Leeds. And um, none of them could understand my accent. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the, the, the Americans love a British accent though, so it's a real opportunity, I mean. British, I, yeah, I think it's Yorkshire now. I don't think it's, yeah. I don't but, um, <laughs> You know, you, what you can do as well is that, and, and I talked before from what Deepak was saying about, you know, about, you know, how, are we doing things that, you know, maybe don't have a life outside of COVID-19. And, and one of the things that is going to change, and I know it's an obvious thing to say, but the world, people aren't going to be able to travel all over the world and go to meetings and people are not going to be as keen to jump on a plane to go to, you know, to, to go through the, the passport control or whatever it will be, you know, whether it will be, you know, you need to have immunization, whatever it is to get whatever you'll be. This, what we're doing now, you know, will not go away. It will become more popular. Um, and I think that because of that, you know, people, I've had more Zoom calls than I've had face-to-face -face interactions with my wife and kids over the past four years, which is not good. Um, but, you know, it, it is becoming the norm. And more and more people are turning around and getting used to this. So the world is definitely going to get smaller, I think, because of this. Um, mm, yeah, definitely. Jeremy, I think we might have had um, Nick trying to ask a question. Oh, yeah. Nick, let's bring you in. Or, or a comment or a question, whatever that is. Nick. No. Nick Costaris. No. No. Just while we're waiting, I'm going to type in our, our call in. Just referring back to, to Deepak, one thing I want to say, Deepak, for us, the, the key thing for us in generating long term value is that we've gained a lot of licenses that potentially otherwise wouldn't have gained given the situation. Um, and they're not just specifically related to hand sanitizer, it's just the general handling of duty suspended alcohol. So for us as a business, the, um, one of our previous uh, main revenue streams was um, pre-batch cocktails, kegged cocktails and so on. This actual license allows us to um, massively reduce the, the cost that, and, and the cash flow, increases our cash flow allowance um, by having one of these licenses for when we do come out of um, the whole lockdown. Whether the market's there or not, um, again, that's to be decided. But I think, as Jeremy said, I think the key thing for us here is we're not pivoting, you know, to create another successful business. We're pivoting because uh, our current business doesn't exist at the moment. And we're trying to um, create something in line with the market conditions at the moment to sustain our business so that when we come out of this, we can repivot back to, you know, either the pre previous model or to a new model that works given those current market conditions. Yeah, absolutely right. Uh, ben, my, my more question was if, you the change is not in your dna and you need to get hold of richard sale in us uh, to to tell you that you can go into another market if that's not the core of the business itself then that's more of the point was that then how do you pivot after do you get another richard sale two and a three and a four who keep telling you it, it will obviously become more cumbersome as you keep going on that was more yeah. of the point there I mean, if, if we say, for instance, if we, you know, if we'd started doing this, but didn't know the whole thing, we, we brought um, someone like Richard in. I think, uh, I don't know if you'll agree with this, Richard, but, you know, you learn by doing. And, and if the, oh, the company, I, I the absolutely Richard agree. Was, I agree. You learn by doing, but sometimes it helps to just be steered slightly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so the company that's working with Richard at the moment will probably pick up some of the kind of the, the sparking ideas that were like, OK, well, to, to make this more efficient, we need a back end system and so on. And so they, they might, you know, not need to create another Richard. It might be that Richard can just help them again in the future quicker than he could before, or he knows what he's going to do next. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's what Jeremy is saying. It's about creating the muscle memory for pivoting. Um, mm. it, it's, the, it's the kind of the, the routes and channels that you go down when you know you need to change and, and how, how do you create that change. And I think for me, that, that, that resilience point is just the main thing. You can put your mind to it. You can do pretty much anything, but yeah. Um, yeah. I think I think the other point to make is that you know we're not we're not move, we're not we're not creating a whole lot of businesses here. What we are creating is um, 
offshoots from current vision, uh, yeah. offshoots from uh, pivot, pivoting and, and kind of zooming in on areas of the business or, or the business model that we can expand at this time, mm-hmm. which yes, may well shrink as we go into something else, but there'll be another part of the business model that you can look at when something else comes along that you can kind of zoom in and, 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 and expand on as well. The, um, the point I want to pick up on across the board is, and, and Zoe made it as well, now is a fantastic time to increase your network. And when we talk about network at Entrepreneurial Spark, we talk about increasing the team because more brains and more, more ideas and more thinking all in this melting pot, more insight is just as good as having a team sat around you. So now is the time to go and increase your team by expanding your network, finding the Richards in your life and, and out, out there and, and, and figuring out who can actually help you do this. Because we aren't going to be able to do this sat on our own at home, um, all isolated away. So just like Zoe's done, go build your network, go and, go and have those conversations, which is building your team. Um, so yeah, uh, that's just the, the, the kind of the final point I wanted to make on that. I think on that whole, Jeremy, I talked before about the world getting smaller and Zoom calls, and I joked a little bit about, you know, how they can happen, but, you know, people are willing to meet you this afternoon to discuss what your idea is. Mm. People, I mean, we've been on open phones from the FA to the British Army, you know, but we haven't had to turn around and say, can you fit us in at three o'clock, can you fit us We literally set up a Zoom call and we send them an email and an invite. Now, if they don't want to meet you, they can't meet you. You know, I'm not saying for one minute it's as easy as that, but you know people are willing to move on things now people are willing to meet you they're willing to talk to you they're willing to give things um it's it's now only half an hour out of their day whereas they'd have to travel or you'd have to travel or you know there are less barriers to to entry to have those conversations so people are willing to have conversations right now there's a hell of a lot of goodwill around as well which i think is a lot Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I'd like to add to that, um, Faye. I've I've always been afraid to ask for help. I've always been, I am. This is me. I do it by myself. I get it done. Job done. That's it. I don't, you know, I don't want to just trouble anybody. Now I'm asking for help, and it's unbelievable the amount of people that come out and say, "What can I? What? Yeah, what can I do? What can I do? You know." And that's been really refreshing. So, um, I'm gonna have to go because I've got another call. But great discussions, everyone. Take Thank you, Take care. Bye-bye. I think one of the differences, Jeremy, is we're all in this together. It's not like a, a recession where there's a part of the part of the economy maybe struggling more than the other. I think we're all in this together. We're all in the same boat, and yeah. I think that's the importance of working together and trying to help each other. Yeah, it certainly has. Um, galvanize a sense of camaraderie and, and bring people together in teams that you wouldn't necessarily be part of uh, any other time. So it's it, absolutely go and leverage those teams, go and leverage those conversations and, and, and go and put that half an hour call in somebody's diary that you've never been able to get in before, for sure. Um, just to Tom's, uh, Tom Price, you just said that uh, really been engrossed with the panel and conversation today. So thank you. And, and that kind of brings me on to just closing out and saying thank you so much to the panelists who've been on today. Uh, it's been absolutely riveting to actually have that conversation with you, all different areas of business, um, non-sector specific, which has been great. So thank you, Richard, over in the US. Uh, thank you, Mark, probably sat, where are you, Leeds, I should imagine? And, yeah, just near the pub. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and Ben, thank you so much uh, for being part of it. Uh, and thank you very much for your questions and joining us today. We will be putting the, the um, link out so other people can watch this. And hopefully you've taken something away with you that you can go and enact in your business and do something with. So thank you very much. And uh, stay safe, stay isolated and save our NHS. And please do take oh. off Robo Monkey. I'm just going to reshare it. Oh, yes. And please, 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 please do. So uh, go, go to the Survey Monkey link and, um, and, and just, uh, just help us to help you. That'd be great. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.